Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Neville and welcome to Selective Imagery. Welcome to Thanks for the Memories, Part 11, the 1956 Nikka 3F Rangefinder Camera. Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about the Nikka 3F, which is a rangefinder camera, a Leica 3 copy, made in Japan in 1956 through 1957 and here's what it looks like. Now I bought this strictly the body because it was never used. Period. Never used. I then sourced to find out what the normal lens was that came with it which happened to be a Nikon Nikkor 50mm f 2.0 lens black belt. It's called a black belt because you're your aperture indicator is black. They were not all that way. And then I managed to source and find an original Nikka lens cap. And I searched even more, and I'll put it on here. I found a Nikka 50 millimeter lens hood metal believe it or not it takes a lot of work to try to end up with something that's complete um, unfortunately it was not offered with a lens so I had to do a bunch of searching and the lens cap, try finding any old lens from this era with original metal lens caps. It's like pulling teeth. Most people are selling lenses without lens caps, and then you end up spending $30, $40 or more to find lens caps for these lenses. So it's very frustrating as a collector. But this was, back to the camera, this was, uh, like I said, a Leica 3 copy. Uh, many countries made copies of Leica lenses. Uh, the USSR obviously did. Uh, other European countries made Leica copies. And all Leica copies were not equivalent in terms of quality. Uh, in the case of the Nikka brand, Nikka was considered one of the best Leica copies you can get. And depending on what source of information that you're reading as you do your as you do your homework. Uh, there are some sources that say that the Nikka rangefinder camera was actually uh, built even better than the Leica original. I'll leave that up to the audience to come to their own conclusions whether you agree or disagree with that statement, but it's something that's out there anyway. Okay, so What's interesting about cameras of this era is Nikka sold cameras all over the world. Okay, and you can see the top plate has the word Nikka on it. All right, but they also sold to different importers, and depending on the importer, they changed the top plate, they changed the name of the camera. Probably the, the biggest. Um, change they made was they made a series of cameras they made this is a, a Nikka 3F they made a Tower 3F and Tower was the brand that Sears sold 
Okay, so Sears obviously was probably one of the biggest retailers in the United States in the 50s, at least in the top three anyway. And everybody wanted to have their products sold in the Sears catalog. And NICA sold their cameras under the trade name Tower to Sears uh, in the United States. So that was kind of a, a neat thing to find out. Now, the difference between this 1956 model and the 1957 model is the 1956 model had a, a round film advance knob, whereas the 57 model had a advanced lever, film advanced lever, rather than a knob. So that's how you can tell the two years apart uh, quickly. Now the history of this camera company I could talk about for way too long. I'm really going to truncate it and just kind of hit a few things. Um, so the history of this camera started around 1935 by a gentleman named Genji Kumajai, who was the inspiration for Nippon slash Nikka camera, and he worked at Seiko, uh, which later became Canon. He left in the 1930s and started a Leica repair and modification shop, adding range finders to models that didn't have them. Eventually, he founded an optics and precision company, which became the future of Nikka, the future Nikka company, as an official Canon repair agency. Now, eventually, due to the war in Europe and the Japanese, you know, of course, they bought cameras, right? They had Leica cameras. Due to the war in Europe, you couldn't get parts for the Leica cameras. You couldn't get accessories for the Leica cameras. So a mandate, a military directive from the Japanese came down to the public, to the manufacturing uh, folks in Japan, that they needed to make a Japanese Leica camera, a Leica copy. And they did, and there were many uh, Leica copies made, uh, whether it be in Europe, in the USSR, uh, it, you know, had a lot of uh, Leica copies. And not all Leica copies were alike. Uh, the uh, Nikka name came out, came about in 1948, and that's all they did was make Leica copies. Now we're gonna go, we're gonna just go over the, the camera a little bit here. Uh, the, the details of the camera and I'll try to go through it fairly quickly. Looking at the front, if I took this lens off, which I can unscrew it, um, you're gonna, it's a LTM mount, which means like a thread mount, um, L39 slash M39. Okay, some will say there's differences, but for the majority of cameras that were made, when you look for a lens, it's gonna go on an old camera like this a L39 slash or M L39 or M39 LTM mount will work on this body. And that is typical. Uh, not 100% guaranteed. Do your homework, make sure before you buy. Uh, now you have this dot, this dial here, which is called the low shutter speed dial. If I get in close with this, Okay. You see that little nub? Okay, that locks this knob in place at 1 25th of a second. This is your high speed shutter speed dial on the top. Okay. So, If you want to use the shutter speed settings on this high speed dial, high speed shutter speed dial, you have to have, you have a detent in here with that locking pin and you cannot move this knob and you have to have it at 1 25th of a second. And then you can lift and adjust this dial so that it lines up with the dot here on the hot shoe and adjust your shutter speed that way. If you want to use the lower speeds, you have to go and adjust this shutter speed on here to say 1 25th of a second and then you unlock this and you can turn it to the slower speed such as you know one second uh, time exposure mode that type of thing all right so in either case if you're going to use the top 
that has to be in the detent and locked at 1 125th of a second. If you're going to use the bottom one, then that has to be set for 1 25th of a second. Okay, so you have uh, three windows here. You have uh, the two windows that are for rangefinder for focusing, and you have a viewfinder window that's a slightly off center from the lens. Okay. You got your your rewind knob. Turn it in the direction of the arrow to rewind your film. You have your shutter release button. It has a dot on it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You've got your film advance knob. The top plate, top part of it, you can adjust the Tell it what type of film you have in the camera. You have a lever here in A mode and R mode. A mode is for advancing the film. It's when you've loaded the, so you need it in that mode to load the film. And so you can advance to the next shot. When you've used your 36 exposures, assuming you had a 36 exposure roll, then you flip this lever to the R mode for rewind and you turn your rewind knob and rewind the film. Okay, you have a film counter. Okay, how many shots have you taken? And you've got nubs. You've got a nub up here. I'm going closer. You got a nub on the opposite side. And you got this dot. Okay, this black dot to the right of my fingernail. So once you've loaded the film, Once you've loaded the film you and you advance it, I'll say, you know, advance it, hit your shutter release, advance it, again, hit your shutter release, and then you advance it and you're ready to shoot. Well, before you go and shoot again, you, you take those nubs and you align the number zero with that dot. And that way you take your shot, you advance it, it tells you you've taken your first shot. And then when you've gone through your roll, like I, like I said, flip the lever to R, rewind the film. Okay. And um, something interesting here is I will okay, advance the film. I have the shutter speed set for one one hundredth of a second. You can see it lining up with that dot. If I take the picture, look where 1 100th is lined up. It's lined up with the red dot. So basically, if you want to set the shutter speed before you advance the film, you lift it and you adjust it to line up with the red dot. And then when you advance the film, notice how the upper shutter speed dial moves and the dot on your shutter release moves. And voila, when it's all the way, there you go. One one hundredth is lined up with that dot. So if you want to adjust it before you advance the film, line up your shutter speed with the red dot. If you follow the manual, it says adjust the shutter speed dial after you've wound the film, and then you align it with the black dot. Pick your poison. Important thing is when you're done shooting for the day, after you've taken your shot and you go, okay, I'm done for the day, don't advance the film. Because you're, you're uh, stretching springs and things like that inside. So instead of having them stretched where they could wear out quicker, when you're done for the day, after you take that shot and you say, I'm done, don't advance the, don't advance the roll until you go to shoot again. Now, when you look at the back, you have two windows to look through. One is your viewfinder, which is for composition and framing of your subject before you take the image. And the other one is, is used for um, tied in with the rangefinder. Okay, and you're gonna have a superimposed image. And you're gonna take the focus ring on your lens until those images line up. When those images line up perfect, 
you're in focus. Some people don't like that about rangefinder cameras. So that could be considered a negative for some people. Um, you have a, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit more. You have a PC sync. And let's just say, uh, if you have the manual for the camera and you read the manual, depending on what you have your shutter speed set for, the camera, the camera will know whether you're shooting with flash bulbs or an electronic flash. In other words, M-Sync or X-Sync. Uh, another disadvantage, a big thing is parallax error. What is parallax error? Well, when you have an SLR, which is why a lot of people loved it when SLRs came out, what you, what you see is what you get. You look through the lens and, and everything you see in that viewfinder, I mean, well, they'll tell you, okay, the viewfinder shows you 98% of what the lens is seeing, you know. So for the most part, what you're seeing when you look through the viewfinder is what's going to be on your picture. Not so with these, I mean, uh, except for when you have the 50. When you have the 50 millimeter lens on here and you look through the viewfinder, what you see is what you get. If you put a 35 millimeter wide angle lens on here, or you put a 135 millimeter telephoto lens, which I'm gonna show you here. It has the LTM threaded, like a thread mount, L39 and or M39. Okay, it's a 135 f3.5 Canon lens. As soon as you put on one of those other lenses, other than a 50, you have to buy a cold shoe mount viewfinder attachment. And if I put this up here just the right way, you can see you can see the rectangle in there. Okay. So when I look through the back of this, I see a, a yellow uh, rectangle with the 135 written underneath it, because it's for a 135 millimeter lens. I adjust my focus on the lens. I make a mental note, oh, I'm focused at 30 feet. I go to the back. I got a scale here that I adjust. I set it for 30 feet. And I'm looking through with this on the, with this on the, on the cold shoe like this. I'm looking through and I am framing my subject and I take the picture. This is another reason why a lot of people, you know, don't want to go back with time and use a rangefinder camera. You have to have one of these for every lens that's different than a 50 millimeter lens. Plus rangefinder cameras are limited to 135 millimeter focal length. They can't go longer than that. That's another disadvantage. Or you, instead of having one of these for every lens, you can buy what they call a very focal model which has two adjustments it has the meters or feet adjustment and it has another adjustment where you dial in what focal length your lens is so it may have a setting for multiple settings 35 millimeter 50 85 105 135 you match up your focal length you put in your distance you're good you only need one of these instead of one for every different lens but it costs more money uh, so that's up to you. Uh, the only other thing really to show you is the back of the camera. Bottom of the camera, sorry. You got the bottom plate, you got the, your threads for your tripod mount. It's not centered. It's on the, on the end, which is common for a lot of old cameras. You have a rear plate release. You do not have a back that swings open. To make it easier to load the film, eventually they came out with that, but not, not in this era. Everything was bottom loaded. So you have to basically unlock the bottom plate. Then when you take it off, see, see how this, on this end, you just see the plate. On this end, you see that, see that little nub? And the plate kind of goes down. So when I take this off, that's an alignment pin, so you make sure you put the plate on the right the right way. It can only go on one way. And then there's your little little diagram. It tells you your leader has to be four inches long. And when you put your film in, your film canister goes in here. Your film is going in between this little slit. And this is your take up reel. But initially, when you load the film, you got to pull this take-up spool out, 
you have to put the leader on it and then you have to slide the take up spool back into the camera at the same time you're putting in the film canister all the while your film is carefully getting slid down into the body of the camera then you put the plate back on and you lock it okay and that's about it so um, I hope you enjoyed this video I am gonna do uh, some more down the road I've got um, a 1968 camera of interest that is very very it's not just rare it's scarce um, I'm going to talk about it. I'm not going to tell you what it is right now. And I have a camera that I'll be, because uh, I'm waiting for a part, one more part for it to be complete. And then I have a camera from the 1890s, which I'm also waiting for one item to show up. And I will do a uh, discussion about uh, an old 1890s era uh, 5x7 plate camera. And we'll have a discussion about that. So in the meantime, get out there and shoot and enjoy taking pictures and uh, take care. I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching my channel. I really appreciate it. Please give me a like and leave a comment, pro or con. Just please be respectful. And if you really enjoyed it, you know, please subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate it. And remember my motto, enjoy life, capture some of it get out there and get some of your best images irregardless of the genre that you choose to shoot take care and god bless